All right, so uh, for our final uh, panel today, uh, we, we started in the morning with the past and then covered the present, and uh, we have the uh, fun task of discussing the future. Uh, if you know anything about political scientists trying to predict the future, uh, you're probably skeptical about everything that we're about <laughs> to say, uh, <laughs> whether it be the results of the 2016 presidential election or what's gonna happen after the end of the Cold War. Uh, I suppose uh, you, you could say things about our track record that are not particularly uh, great. Um, but I don't think the purpose here is necessarily to make predictions, but to uh, think about ways that we can shape the future uh, of the international order uh, in East Asia, in particular, in a way that uh, uh, produces more desirable outcomes uh, for everybody. And so in that spirit, um, I'd like to introduce uh, really what's an all-star panel. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ryo um, uh, Sahashi from the University of Tokyo, who's really one of the leading uh, younger, I guess you're not young anymore, uh, <laughs> young, yeah. younger uh, experts uh, on U.S.-Japan uh, relations, among other things. Um, and he's going to kick off the discussion uh, by exploring uh, several possible forms that the future uh, East Asian order might take, and then uh, we'll turn to Professor Tom Christensen from uh, Columbia, uh, again, a, a leading expert on uh, Chinese foreign policy, uh, and he's going to reflect on uh, his own experience uh, managing North Korea in government and try to draw some uh, lessons for uh, contemporary uh, policy towards North Korea. And then we have my colleague, uh, Professor Jim Furon. Um, uh, who's really sort of a leading theorist uh, of international relations. Um, and he's going to take a broader view and talk about uh, a sort of uh, provocative ideas about uh, how we should think about the international order, in particular the role of nuclear weapons, uh, which might uh, complicate uh, a lot of the conventional wisdom about where the international order is headed. And finally, uh, Ambassador Sasai will add a Japanese perspective uh, about uh, the international architecture and areas uh, for potential reform. So without further ado, Professor Sahashi. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, it is always very a uh, great honor to come back to Stanford University as uh, alumni of APAC. So uh, today, uh, even though uh, we political scientists have really bad reputation, reputated uh, in predictions, uh, let me provide a few uh, alternative uh, model uh, to predict East Asian future. And uh, I will show uh, just uh, two slides. One, this is the one, and uh, this is the second. But uh, uh, I don't think I will make a lot of confusion uh, to propose uh, these four models. Um, as we, as all of us know very well, a uh, lot of things has changed uh, in the last one decade uh, in East Asia, one or two decades in East Asia. Like rise of China, balance of power has, cha has been changed. And also Japan, defense policy and security policy uh, has been changed and you know, really well, really, really seriously. Uh, and you know, if, if not only including a defense budget, but also Japan's security platform, I mean, legal platform has been changed, as you know. But for me, to predict the, fu to predict the future of East Asian system from now on, the most important variable is the commitment from the United States. And, and the secondly, uh, the very important uh, variable uh, to predict the future is uh, regional state response or uh, dissolve or debalancing or balancing against the changing uh, East Asian system or order. So uh, today um, I want to provide uh, the four uh, set of ideal types or models uh, of East Asian order. But before going into the detail, uh, let me say just one thing. Some, for some people in IR or political scientists, political science, uh, they really prefer greater power politics 
And like uh, the recent article from John Miyashima uh, on international security, uh, for some people, uh, order or orders are only shaped by greater power and greater power politics. But to predict the future of East Asia, for me, the very important thing we have to consider is the response or behavior of regional lesser powers. Because if we look back last six decades in East Asia, uh, as we have argued in the last two panels, how other powers, I mean, what I mean by other is non-US, non-China, non-Japan uh, powers uh, behave a really important factor to shape the regional uh, landscape and also regional system. So uh, in today's uh, categorizations of my whole models, I intentionally use uh, such a lesser powers perspective. So not only about US commitment or US power itself or balance of power, but also I emphasize, I try to emphasize uh, lesser powers uh, uh, on dissolve and uh, behavior for balancing. The first ideal type or model is uh, enhanced San Francisco system. I employ the definition of Kent Calder's uh, San, Fran San Francisco system. So uh, you, you may find out some difference for my uh, definition uh, from uh, the uh, previous speaker's definition of San Francisco system. In the session, first session in the morning, uh, they employed the definition of San Francisco system uh, based on more uh, from historical studies. But I think uh, Kent Calder's uh, way of definition is uh, more focused on the alliance network and, uh, and the importance of bilateral alliance network uh, during the Cold War. And the last, last three decades in East Asia, uh, even after the end of the Cold War, what we have observed in East Asia is enhancement of that San Francisco system, uh, which has been established uh, since the 1950s. In this uh, model, U.S. commitment does not experience major change, even in the future. And Japan, Australia, and other very important partners of the United States try to enhance, try to enhance uh, the partnership with the United States and other important uh, uh, countries uh, in the region. And the very important uh, precondition for this model is U.S. commitment has been constant. And Japan and Australia uh, really rely on the same system and they try to make more burden sharing uh, towards the same future or uh, uh, keeping the status quo of the uh, San, Francis San Francisco system. However, even under this model, uh, we have to uh, take into consideration uh, Chinese increasing influence in the region in economic terms. So, uh, how to uh, hedge or how to uh, uh, respond uh, to the increasing influence uh, from the uh, rising Chinese economic and maybe political influence is really key uh, in this model. But uh, again, uh, this model uh, has the very strong condition U.S. commitment uh, is constant, and reliability or credibility of the United States is also constant. Second model is groups or groups of hedging nations. Um, if the United States fail to be reliable and credible partner, and also cost of managing the alliance is too high for the lesser power countries, like for Japan or Australia, Nations would prefer to keep their own strategic autonomy. One attractive choice for them is to team up against both superpowers, United States and China, in each specific area of concerns. Even without it, lesser powers try to negotiate and engage with each superpower for their own national interest. Under this uh, model, I don't say uh, U.S based architecture, security architecture or economic architecture will be dissolved. Maybe they will keep it uh, because for their own national interest. But what I want to emphasize, emphasize here is 
they may be, I mean, lesser power might be, uh, might behave without uh, kind of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, under more non-hierarchical hierarchical order. I mean, uh, they try to, uh, they try to preserve uh, their own autonomy. Some people uh, uh, argue like concert of powers uh, in East Asia uh, as a model, like uh, uh, Hugh White uh, in Australia. But I really don't think concert of powers will really fly in East Asia because, uh, you know, uh, to, to make happen concert of powers, uh, you know, a concert-based order is essentially two tiered arrangements with one set of order and rules for the great power and the other set of rules of order rules for lesser powers. But I really don't think lesser powers really, satis really be satisfied by such. So uh, hedging uh, nations, I mean, including a lot of lesser and smaller powers uh, might be very important to, uh, uh, to uh, understand. And <coughs> the third model is uh, Emerging China Japan rivalry. I, I really believe this scenario is a little, a little bit uh, popular among some theorists. And uh, they argue if the United States uh, commitment is weaker, uh, Japan uh, might want to be attracted uh, to compete uh, with uh, China by itself. But I really don't think this uh, model is really likely uh, because uh, the power itself uh, is, uh, matters a lot. Uh, Japan's power uh, cannot compete well uh, with uh, Chinese power in the future in, in a decade, in, uh, in more decades. But uh, this is a, a third model, so I have to uh, propose. But I think uh, some people, like Australian uh, Peter Jennings, uh, Aspie, uh, proposed Plan B idea uh, recently. And that, that Plan B is very close to this you know, uh, uh, scenario. That is, you know, if uh, United States commitment to the region uh, really decreases, uh, Australia and Japan, these countries should prepare Plan B, and they have to increase defense budget very radically. So, um, Again, I don't think this scenario is really happening uh, or will happen uh, because of the balance of power, but uh, I have to uh, pick up this scenario. The fourth scenario is sinicization. Sinicization uh, is uh, when China is the only superpower in the region and other cannot have luxury to hedging with the other uh, great power. Uh, regional countries are try to, uh, I mean, uh, Regional countries uh, give up their own autonomy and have to accept uh, the Chinese authority in this region. That is a model of sinicization. But I put uh, the resistance uh, here because uh, as long as a Chinese vision of the order is pluralistic and illiberal in basic value and principles, uh, it is inevitable regional countries try to resist against such future. So this is just a, a sketch of my whole models. Uh, I only have uh, 10 minutes to describe this. Uh, so maybe you have a lot of questions and want to argue against, or you just simply want to ignore <laughs> my own categorizations. <laughs> but uh, my point is, you know, uh, we can uh, come up with these four models at least. And Finally, let me use the last two or three minutes uh, to say about Japan's choice and Japan's strategy. And Japan's choice is clearly uh, the first scenario, enhanced San Francisco system. While Japan started to fix its relationship with China so seriously last two years, and this is the point uh, last two, uh, the, the previous panel discussed, it doesn't mean Japan has made strategic choices like to align with China. What Japan pursues through its own vision toward free and open in the Pacific is to keep the rule-based order in the region and also to induce China and its order building efforts towards a set of rules and norms cherished under the post-war US-led order. However, Japan's strategic dilemma is deepened by its uncertain commitment from the United States. 
Also, the cost of maintaining alliance would be very important factor. I don't only mean host nation support or bilateral trade issues with the United States, which is happening now uh, at the government level, but also U.S. very tight control over technology and investment, which has been exercised by a lot of U.S. ministries in Washington, is another serious issue uh, for Japan and other regional countries. Because, of course, decoupling economy uh, has a really big cost uh, for the alliance partners. But uh, let me emphasize the most important part. Japan's hope is the continuation of inclusive regionalization of East Asia. If not, as the previous speaker said, Japan cannot survive economically and politically in East Asia. And for that sake, uh, to preserve the first scenario, I mean, uh, enhanced uh, San Francisco system is very important. But for that sake, uh, American commitment is, should be to be too well balanced. Still, uh, and just let me uh, make uh, some final words. I don't think the second scenario, group of hedging nations, uh, is where Japan could feel comfortable. Rather, Japan should suffer from the difficulty of its statecraft between two superpowers, US and China. So do other lesser powers. Teaming up among lesser powers is very tough too. Like uh, Japan team up with Australia and other uh, important ASEAN countries against two superpowers, try to keep their aut strategic autonomy is really difficult. But it could become un unavoidable uh, if United States commitment is really declined and reputation and reliability is really declined. That is plan B thinking. Sinicization is the last option Japan might choose by cultural and normative reason and by lack of trust. Some people defer to the historical experience in East Asia, like David Kahn, uh, now in Uni uh, University of South California. But I argue the power of resistance depends on characteristic of China-led order building process. And contractual aspect is very important. And as I said, a uh, liberal nature, e sorry, illiberal, e illiberal e nature of Chinese or China-led uh, order building uh, efforts continue, it could be very difficult uh, for other countries to simply accept such order making process. So uh, resistance uh, might be a very important uh, aspect uh, to predict. Okay, uh, this is the uh, uh, end of my uh, short uh, speech. Thank you very much for listening. Just stay. I think <coughs> I have my timer here, so I'll keep myself honest. Uh, thanks a lot. I wanted to thank the organizers for having me. Having me, Giwok Shin, um, Ambassador Sasai, uh, Takeo uh, Hoshi, uh, Mike Armacos, uh, Carl Eikenberry. It's a real honor to be here. I wanted to say at the beginning that uh, uh, Giwok Shin said at the beginning that he's wearing his tie for the f first time and uh, third time this year. Um, so I, I'd say that uh, this is the first time I'm speaking without a tie because I actually read the instructions and this is Stanford and it said business casual. I think Stanford takes this really seriously even though it's a, it's a conference involving Ambassador Sasai and people like that. So I didn't wear a tie. This is my first time. So um, I, I think uh, I need to adjust uh, more ca cautiously to the California rules because I, I came in and Carl had one on, Gewick had one on. Uh, the whole Stanford team seemed to be I wearing. I take off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. See, I've set an example. You so, make a loop. <laughs> outstanding. I feel much better now. I feel much better. The alliance is working. The alliance is working. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is confidence building measures. Because if you think about East Asia as a as a region in transition because of power shifts, uh, it certainly is between China and Japan, and I believe it also is to some degree between China and the United States, at least as it applies to the region, if not the globe. One of the ways to prevent uh, the increasing tensions of a, a shift uh, from leading to conflict is to build confidence building uh, through multilateral uh, organizations or institutions um, that involve various uh, parties, great, especially great powers in, in a region. And um, I guess my talk is going to make you feel even worse about North Korea. Um, it's hard to feel even worse about North Korea than you probably already do. 
But here's a, a way that North Korea prevents the region from being stable that you may, may not have thought about before. Um, when I was in the government from 2006 to 2008, in the last uh, year and a half, we had an initiative in the East Asian Pacific uh, Affairs Bureau of the State Department uh, to try to insert into the six-party talks process that Ambassador Sasai and I were both involved in um, uh, an idea of confidence building in East Asia that was called the Northeast Asia Peace and Security Mechanism. It was called NIAPSM. And it was supposed to involve all the members of the six-party talks. Uh, if North Korea behaved itself, it could join it. And the idea was to include the United States, U.S. allies, and non-allies like Russia and China in serious security discussions to prevent various tensions from rising to the point of military conflict. Uh, I worked on the project. I thought it was very constructive in its, um, in its c conceptualization, and I was very happy to work on, on this under the leadership of uh, Ambassador Kathy Stevens, who was here at Stanford for a long time. Um, she did a great job leading this. It was very in, uh, uh, a very constructive process, so I enjoyed working on it. But it was also very instructive. It was instructive to see why it failed. And uh, it failed in large part uh, because North Korea couldn't join the Northeast Asia Peace and Security Mechanism until it made some strategic decisions to change its behavior. It seemed ridiculous to include it as a full-scale member in, a, in an uh, institution that was about stabilizing the region when it was constantly in, engaged in destabilizing behavior. And China was unwilling to have a six minus one formula, which is what we proposed. In other words, we can meet without North Korea until it starts to behave itself, and then we can include it later. So we'll have a six minus one formula for this institution. And China refused to do this. And the basic argument in China is it can't be about them without them. And the argument was, and I think it was a convincing argument by uh, our Chinese counterparts, that if you have a serious Northeast Asia peace and security mechanism discussion about uh, enhancing security in the region, it's almost certainly going to be about North Korea a lot of the time. Because what was the big threat to security in the region at the time was North Korea. And China was unwilling to have a five-on-one formula where everybody got together and talked about China's uh, ally from 1961, North Korea, um, without North Korea in the room because it would spoil China's diplomacy with North Korea. My memory is Russia was also reluctant. I'm not entirely sure about that. Russia wasn't very active in the process at that time, but I think they were also opposed. My guess is Russia today would be opposed because now Russia is much more involved in North Korea issues than it was before. Uh, President Putin has his pivot to Asia um, that he's trying to push, and he's trying to play a Russian leadership role. So that would prevent these types of healthy discussions between the United States, its allies, and non-allies in Northeast Asia from going forward because uh, North Korea is still a problem. And I think despite some of the triumphant uh, statements of the Trump administration in June of 2018 after the first summit, um, we haven't seen much progress on denuclearization. We're unlikely to see it. I think Ambassador Sasai's intervention in the last session was instructive on that score that uh, if only we could solve the North Korea problem and worry about these issues of uh, peace and stability in, in Korea, that would be great, but it's unlikely to happen soon. So North Korea's uh, role in spoiling the opportunity for multilateral confidence building measures among the great powers in East Asia will likely persist long into the future. Um, it's possible that the Trump administration would, would be willing to have uh, discussions that had North Korea in the room, because after all, the president has expressed quite a bit of respect, uh, sometimes even affection, uh, for the North Korean leader. Uh, but I doubt that this would be a good idea. And I'll close my comments with this. Um, I want to keep them short, because I really want to have discussion. Um, if North Korea were to enter multilateral discussions on security in East Asia uh, under current conditions, I think it would spoil one of the core concepts that was there when we considered this in the Bush administration, and that was whatever we do in terms of confidence building with non-allies can't do anything to undermine or complicate the U.S. bilateral alliances in the region. It can't hurt the U.S.-Japan alliance. It can't hurt the U.S.-ROK alliance. And it shouldn't harm 
the relations among those allies either, even though these are bilateral alliances. So that was a core principle. We wanted to reassure Tokyo and Seoul that these propositions were not designed to replace the alliance system, which was still the core of the security stabilization efforts of the United States in East Asia. The problem now is if you had North Korea in the room with the U.S. allies and Russia, um, under current conditions, North Korea could cause a huge amount of stress in that system to the U.S. alliance system. Uh, between the United States and South Korea, which uh, already is showing some uh, stress in how to deal with North Korea, uh, particularly as North Korea stiff arms the United States, South Korea still seems to want to have a relatively accommodating posture towards North Korea at a time that the United States might be moving in another direction. Korea and Japan, uh, we haven't talked much about it in this room. We talked about the historical problems between Korea and Japan, but Korea-Japan relations right now are just terrible. And under those circumstances, <laughs> North Korea could play, uh, wreak a lot of havoc on South, Korea, uh, South Korea's relations with Japan and this kind of structure. Um, and I think even U.S.-Japan relations could be put under strain um, in this kind of structure by North Korea if they played uh, certain manipulative games uh, in, on that score. Uh, so it's, um, it's a shame. And I think uh, some Chinese diplomats understand uh, the costs that North Korea raises for China in its regional diplomacy because uh, China's relationship with North Korea and its, its, its constant need uh, to protect North Korea from various forms of pressure have prevented China from having uh, serious discussions with the United States and its allies on, uh, on security measures. And there's still the ASEAN Regional Forum, but that's a very, very diffuse uh, grouping. It includes a lot of different countries, um, and I don't think it's a real replacement for this idea. I think this idea is a good one for the long run. Um, I'm not really sure how it can go forward uh, until either North Korea changes its uh, uh, posture towards the outside world or uh, China and now maybe Russia changes its attitudes about North Korea's importance to be included in such an organization uh, and its willingness to discuss things like North Korean nuclearization and other destabilizing North Korean activities without Pyongyang represented in the room. So uh, I say that out of sadness as much as anger, and uh, I just uh, raise that because that was my experience in 07, 08, uh, with what was a truly constructive idea, I believe, uh, by the U.S. government, uh, floated with all the members of the six-party talks, um, and it fell flat on its face in large part because of the realities of North Korea and the realities of China's, what I see as China's dysfunctional relationship uh, with North Korea that prevents China from having a more constructive engagement of the region. I'll stop there. Hi, thanks. Uh, so, so thanks. Um, this is, as, as uh, Philip's remarks may have suggested, this is going to be a rather different kind of um, brief talk, uh, I think, from the others. And it's main, that's mainly because I have no expertise whatsoever in this area. Uh, I teach, you know, Introduction to International Politics for the undergraduates, and I give a couple lectures on the rise of China that talks about, you know, security issues in Northeast Asia a little bit. I've written a little bit about kind of U.S. grand strategy, but I really am an outsider here. So as Philip mentioned, this is going to be kind of a 30,000 or 60,000 foot view. Uh, I hope it's entertaining, if not entirely true or correct, but we'll see. So. Um, so Trump administration foreign policy has, has overall been a disaster for U.S. leadership and respect in the international system uh, that the U.S. played a major role, of course, in creating after World War II. Um, it's been basically an erratic shambles the last couple of years. Uh, but it would be a mistake to think that everything can go, just go back to normal after Trump as if he was a, uh, just a bizarre aberration. He is an aberration, uh, but only in part. Um, by accident or design, some of Trump's isolationist foreign policy instincts are reflective of uh, what I think are deeper structural changes in the international system that we are going to continue to operate uh, after he's no longer president. Uh, and there are also changes that the U.S. foreign policy establishment has uh, a, a quite vested interest in downplaying and disregarding. So to summarize a, a, a rather longer set of arguments very briefly, 
uh, the consequences of the nuclear revolution for international politics and for U.S. foreign policy have not been adequately taken on board. Uh, and by, by nuclear revolution, what I'm referring to is simply the advent of nuclear weapons and thermonuclear bombs in particular. Um, in the nuclear world, large-scale territorial conquest among major powers engaged in total economic mobilization and massive land campaigns, such as we saw in the first half of the 20th century, is just no longer feasible. Uh, so for one example, consider North Korea. Before the Missile Age, there was no way such a tiny, economically weak country could prevent itself from being taken over by a motivated major power army unless it had a strong alliance with another major power. In the nuclear era, uh, and even with power, even just with, in this case, powerful conventionally armed missiles, North Korea can be almost perfectly secure against land invasion and conquest without any alliances at all. Um, this is all the more true for major powers and even major powers like Japan or Germany that do not currently have nuclear weapons but that have the capability to produce them in short order. Uh, a neglected consequence of the nuclear revolution is that the primary function of major power alliances has also changed. Uh, in the conventional world, major power alliances used to be about aggregating military capabilities. So in the conventional world, alliances were absolutely critical even for the very strongest of states because which state had the most soldiers and tanks strongly influenced the odds of winning a war and in turn the possibility of keeping or losing uh, control of your territory. And as a result, if you, you know, read diplomatic history, uh, what, you'll, what is quite striking uh, in contrast to, to these days is that before 1945, international politics was fundamentally about who would ally with whom in the event of major war. It was basically a Game of Thrones. Since nuclear weapons, the Game of, ma the game, the game of Thrones among major powers is over. So uh, in a nuclear world, the state just does not need an alliance to defend its territory. Um, nuclear weapons will do. Um, as a result, relative conventional capabilities, you know, how many soldiers and tanks you have, no longer matter in the same way. Uh, and again, a good example to think about is tiny North Korea. Now, I'm not saying that conventional capabilities are irrelevant and unnecessary, but rather that their function has changed in a nuclear world uh, like alliances. Some conventional capabilities can still be important for a nuclear armed state to be able to credibly generate nuclear risk in a contest over foreign policy interests that are not clearly vital interests like, uh, like islands, for example. Uh, uh, there are more involved arguments about nuclear crises and deterrence theory here that I, I, I've got to skip over. But so back to the main line. So the U.S. could have attempted to solve the problem of extended deterrence of the Soviet Union in the 1950s and 60s by helping West Germany, South Korea, and Japan to get nuclear weapons. And in fact, Eisenhower seems to have wanted to do just this in Europe, uh, in Europe by helping West Germany go nuclear. Uh, the U.S. chose not to do this for a complex set of uh, reasons that are you know, different in different cases, but generally involving a distaste for nuclear proliferation to potential competitors and to states whose own conflicts might escalate to nuclear levels. The result of that choice or a set of choices over a period of time is what has been called since the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, unipolarity. Uh, unipolarity refers to an international distribution of, of a, a range of kind of standard indices of na national power that's historically unprecedented uh, still, you know, extremely unequal. But, but this thing called unipolarity is not, as it's often talked about in, in uh, our field at any rate, it's not a brute fact about the an underlying distribution of material power. Instead, it's an ongoing policy choice by the U.S. And uh, I, I'd say, in, in brief, the policy of unipolarity has two core uh, closely related components. Uh, first, unipolarity means that the U.S. spends an absolutely staggering amount on its military relative to other states. Uh, U.S. aggregate GDP comprises, I just, just uh, looked this up um, uh, using World Bank figures, 22% of global GDP uh, as of 2016. Uh, but U.S. military spending comprises somewhere between 45 and 50% of to total global military spending. That is massively out of whack, and it's historically unprecedented for, uh, for the top states. Um, the second uh, main component, related component of this, you know, the policy choice that is unipolarity uh, is maintenance of security umbrella alliances in Europe and Asia. Uh, these are post-conventional world alliances in which one state forgoes nuclear weapons and the other, uh, the U.S., provides assurances of material and potentially nuclear support. So this is the system that's starting to break down, um, a process that some of Trump's uh, crazy talk 
uh, crazy from the perspective of the U.S. foreign policy establishment, at least, reflects. And I mean, you know what I mean, anti-NATO, imagining South Korea and Japan with nuclear weapons and so on. Uh, the core structural issue, the issue that Trump's um, isolationist comments raise, whether by accident or design, is that it's not clear uh, that the level of national security threat to the U.S. that would result from winding down the policy of unipolarity or gradually folding up the umbrellas um, is large enough to justify maintaining the very forward military posture that the U.S. inherited and has maintained from the Cold War. This is especially so in the face of growing opportunity costs of U.S. military spending on defending wealthy major power allies. Uh, opportunity costs are growing mainly due to economic mismanagement and demographic change in the U.S. So Russia cannot invade and conquer Germany or even Poland if it had nuclear weapons. China cannot invade and conquer Japan. And if any of, uh, uh, if any of them acquired nuclear weapons, that would be true for South Korea, Vietnam, even Taiwan. The classical balance of power logic on which George Kennan and others based the U.S.'s post-45 major power alliance systems is simply no longer relevant. As a result, it's not so clear why come home America will not be an increasingly plausible and attractive position for U.S. foreign policy, despite the strong inertial resistance of the U.S. foreign policy establishment. So what are the implications of gradual folding of the U.S.'s security umbrella in Asia? Uh, I think this is going to depend, it'll depend mainly on political and economic developments in China that are unfortunately basically hard or impossible to predict. Uh, this is, and, and here I'm, it turns out I'm going to be echoing some things that um, Ambassador Armikos said this morning. Uh, you know, if for domestic political and economic reasons China's leadership pursues an increasingly threatening and aggressive military posture with respect to the various islands, including Taiwan, uh, then a transition to greater military effort by Japan, South Korea, Vietnam, and perhaps others is likely, or more likely. Uh, in, in that scenario, the U.S. and Japan's strategic interests remain well aligned. Um, also, other states in the region threatened by a, a more aggressive China. And significant cooperation and coordination would continue, even if there would be a shift uh, towards more self-reliance for uh, homeland uh, and naval capabilities. Um, uh, a balancing alliance or coordinating security institutions of some sort would be natural. Uh, on the other hand, if China's leadership heads in a more cautious direction or if it implodes economically in a way that does not generate highly aggressive nationalism, say, it's harder to say. Uh, there would be less need for close security cooperation but also fewer dangers like nuclear proliferation, arms racing, nuclear crises, et cetera, which of course would be a good thing. So that's kind of the question. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, speak uh, from Japanese perspective uh, on the future Asia-Pacific uh, system or challenge of the sort. Whatever the model or system you envision uh, in the future, if you don't address the, uh, this strategic question or strategic challenge of rise of China and North Korean the nuclear you know, development, not much meaning, I would say. It's a, it's a simply thinking. And so, uh, and so I'd like to address from the specific uh, problem and then uh, basically try to justify the current system. And, uh, and as, as the Mr. Sahaj said, uh, uh, San Francisco press, possibly. But um, first on the Chinese question, the rise of China. No, uh, bad policy is that uh, uh, containment policy. It's a bad policy and we can't really go back. It's not feasible in terms of uh, economic interdependence and uh, it's, a d uh, it's a fact that uh, China will continue to have a big uh, economic uh, uh, power influence in the region. The question is, uh, could we use those economic power for the benefit of the regional prosperity and stability? And, um, and also, uh, you know, if you try to make a containment policy more in the forefront, that would help to make Chinese more undemocratic uh, society. So we have to be careful, not in terms of uh, narrative, but also in terms of our actual policy. 
And I also say that um, the other extreme, this uh, disengagement policy is also wrong. I mean, you know, uh, uh, th this might lead, especially uh, disengagement by the United States. I don't think that will be happening uh, in any future soon, but uh, if we see the vacuum of, of the power, I mean, uh, in the region, as we, we, we have seen in the histories, I mean, uh, you know, when America withdraw after the Korean War from Philippines and Vietnam or whatever place, uh, we all know who occupied the vacuum. So uh, uh, we don't appreciate uh, China-dominated kingdom, China-dominating regional order, uh, and all this uh, declining of uh, post-war liberal order in the region. And so having said it, uh, I would say that good policy is, is basically uh, try to maintain the 70 years of San Francisco system. And, uh, you know, uh, Americans' role in the region is not really built, you know, around uh, just one or two, three years time frame. It's 70 years, a long time. I mean, so there is a value. This is uh, embedded uh, common uh, a treasure of the regional stability. And um, it cannot simply calculate in terms of American uh, money spending. Uh, you know, it, it goes beyond that, even though there is a much uh, debate about how much money Americans are spending. That is true, but uh, I think the value of peace would cost more than what you spend to keep the peace. So uh, we like to continue to see the American commitment and strong presence, both diplomatic, economic, and militarily, and, and uh, they try to maintain the uh, framework of alliance, including uh, Japanese alliance. Uh, uh, what you said, Jim, uh, not a cornerstone or whatever, anchor, whatever you call. And uh, that's a good word to use. And, uh, and I think what we need to do is to increase the deterrence uh, to prepare for the future uh, the configuration of a power shift in the region. And uh, so I think the, this plan B, you know, you know uh, referenced uh, by Australia, is a delusionally, you know, uh, uh, thinking, and uh, and it's a it's a self-fulfilling and a bad bad thinking. Uh, we shouldn't really expect America withdrawing and dissipating from the region. Uh, I think that's a bad idea. Now, uh, what is important is to check against the further Chinese military expansion in the region. Although, at this moment, American uh, military power is still overseeing Chinese, but in the future, uh, 10, 20, 30 years, Americans are sitting and, and behind, I think uh, there will be a danger. So, uh, and also, I think we need to initiate a new effort to, to cap uh, the Chinese military expansion in terms of regional institution, whether it is extensions of uh, your INF uh, treaty with Russia into China or whatever. We have to tell, we have to have a regional opinion that should be some mechanism to stop Chinese military growth, build up, not necessarily uh, creeping expansion to the South China Sea or other places. Uh, on the uh, diplomatic front, I think we need to uh, deal with China when they do good. We should say good, but they don't do good, no good. I think we have to make it explicit. Whatever China does is no good. That's a very bad argument. I think there are good parts, as uh, Jim said. I think uh, when they talk about, uh, you know, uh, environment policy, uh, you know, policy uh, treaty or WTO, even though they are not really following through the WTO. I mean, but still, normative policy, if they think good things, so we say that's good. The important thing is how they would support it. Uh, on, the, uh, on the barrier issues and standard issues, and uh, norm setting, you know, rule of law issues, I think uh, we need to have some patience. We continue to register the point that uh, we need to have China uh, improving. Uh, their own transparency, not only in terms of their economic and trade policy and assistance policy, but also political transparency. And so for that reason, we need to challenge uh, their uh, 
their defined core interests like uh, Uyghur or even Tibet, whatever, and uh, when it comes to human rights issues. I think uh, we, need to, we, we need to start, oh, five minutes, thank you. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, on the issues, and, uh, and eventually we, we have to envision that uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, retreat uh, by the ch current Chinese government on the democracy should not be forever. I mean, there is a time to be boss. Uh, so we have to look at the Chinese politics also in longer term. Is the Chinese economic reform working toward the political reform? That's unknown. But still, we need to keep uh, that possibility in mind when we, we have to address the future Chinese uh, geopolitical ambition in the region because uh, unless there is uh, some democratic process within China, I think it's really hard uh, for us to, uh, to have some balanced uh, you know, external exposition of China. Uh, on the uh, trade and economics, uh, as I said, that, uh, the current American uh, approach, approach itself might be controversial, but if there is a result, we should uh, take advantage of that result of Chinese reform into regional context. So we, 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 if China could reform, I mean, its economic structure and uh, less, uh, you know, subsidies, more transparent, uh, you know, uh, commercial uh, and assistance policy, we should welcome that one. And then that will prepare China to be a part of a wider regional integration, including possibility of their entry into uh, TPP in the future. And that's a high, high bar. But uh, if the United States bilateral deal would help, we would welcome that one. Now, on the uh, North Korean issues, another issue is uh, unless uh, we could work on the North Korean threat, whatever the scheme model, that's not workable. So uh, uh, for the moment, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's unclear whether the American uh, you know, effort to deal with uh, North Korean, it's stuck kind of. I think there are several uh, problems in there. Obviously, there is a gap between the leaders' level decisions and the negotiating level, you know, contact and collaboration, especially on the part of North Korea. Uh, that was uh, manifested pretty clearly in the previous round of uh, their leaders' talk. So that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we should be disengaged. Uh, we continue to get engaged, try to North Korea pulling out uh, to the negotiating table. How you do it, that involves the tactics. I don't get into detail. But I think the important thing is that uh, we shouldn't be really complacent with this uh, defeatist idea that it is impossible. These people say that it is impossible to eliminate uh, North, North Korean nuclear weapon because this is the basis of the North Korean legitimacy and power. I don't, uh, I don't agree with that view. Once you begin to live with that notion, you have to live with North Korean uh, nuclear weapon in the future. That is a situation like uh, you know, India and Pakistan and India and China and uh, some others. And uh, I think that's a bad policy. So the policy should continue to focus on eliminating the nuclear weapon, and a step-by-step -step approach is dangerous, but uh, uh, ground bargain is also difficult. So there should be some way to work on the whole load map. Then you could divide one, two, three steps. Uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, salami uh, steps of the sort. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I think always the uh, most serious issue is the sequencing issues. We all know it, right? Whenever you work on the program, uh, each side uh, asks the other to do something first. Uh, you first, not me first. So it's always a difficult issue. But again, I think uh, at the end, the uh, leader's level decision would matter. Uh, I, uh, I guess that what uh, you know, Tom said about the regional architecture, North Korean uh, you know, peninsula architecture, uh, if there is a successful uh, road to eliminating a North Korean nuclear weapon, of course there is some uh, peace regime uh, to be envisaged. That peace regime has to involve uh, Russia, China, uh, US, Japan, South Korea, and, and, and North Korea. 
if that could be done, uh, this could be a part of, uh, you know, uh, example, not uh, everything, uh, part of the process of Asia-Pacific collaboration for peacemaking. Unless all these sticks could agree on the sum of the peace regime, uh, either one of these would try to pull the leg. I mean, so you have to get at the end on board of all these countries, even if the major thrust or major component of the negotiations is uh, US, North Korea. Others are basically supporters. You do, you do your job. But still, unless we are successful in getting North Korea on board for getting uh, nuclear weapons out, then there is no peace regime in the region. Uh, and finally, on, the, uh, on this uh, wider regional architecture, um, you know, as I said, uh, 70 years of uh, system uh, is, is important. Uh, you know, uh, I think that was done uh, with this Japan-US alliance as, uh, as an integral major part of the alliance system. I think uh, that is working well, possibly the best over the years these days, and uh, we could do more. And uh, what is important is we need to uh, increase the deterrence and networking of the country who share the same values and to prepare for the future advance of China. And China itself uh, doesn't want to be contained. And, uh, and they want to live together with the United States uh, peacefully and uh, to buy the time for them to make them stronger. But uh, we have to also prepare for their ambition too. And um, there are somebody who are talking about multilateral security system region-wide, Asia-Pacific-wide. I don't think it's feasible, to be honest, in the short run. I don't think there is Asia-NATO nor Asia-Helsinki meeting, I think, uh, because there are too much, you know, uh, too many differences uh, of the situation of the country in terms of uh, development, political values, and so forth. So I think the best way is we move uh, with the current system in place and, and improve the system so that there is no uh, ambition to break the system. Uh, finally, this FOIP and uh, FOIP versus uh, BLI, I guess that uh, all this would live together for the same time being. And um, I think China is now reflecting that uh, they, uh, they had a bad the public policy. So I think they are now in the process of adjustment and I, we, we continue to uh, register uh, the problems around this uh, BLI issues and uh, so that uh, they could eventually adapt as they are not doing on the, uh, you know, uh, AIAB, for example. We had uh, much worried about AIAB, uh, but, but some of the pro their projects are okay because of their association with ADB and, and, and the World Bank. So they are also um, changing and ad adapting uh, some of the regional uh, global standard. So uh, we shouldn't be really hopeless about the, what they are, doing, they are doing. I think we need to be patient. Now, and finally, I wanna say this, there is no alternative to the US role in the region. And uh, could China exercise that leadership as the United States did? Would Russia do it? Uh, do all the countries in the region uh, like to be uh, like China or Russia? The answer is no. So I think the United States need to be confident in spite of some of the debate in this country. And uh, I don't think the United States leadership is not gone. It's there. And, uh, and so uh, I'd like to continue to support the United States role in the region. Thank you. Great, those were uh, all uh, excellent presentations. So I, I'd like to begin with um, a question about um, the future of the order, uh, since you know that's the, the title. I think, I think Jim mentioned that there's some who think that uh, Trump is m less uh, a cause and more a consequence of some underlying problems with the 
existing international order, that the order has weakened or somehow uh, created the context for the rise of uh, Trump and other extremist politicians uh, in Europe and other parts of the world. Um, uh, Colgan and Bob Cohane have a piece where they say the international order is rigged, that it favors the wealthy and it doesn't lift all boats like it used to. You could argue that countries like China and India have legitimate grievances about the structure of various institutions that appear to be unfair uh, to their interests, whether it's the voting structure of the International Monetary Fund or the nature of the non-proliferation regime or the Security Council. Um, and so you, you can go on and on. So if, uh, if you were to think about, you know, after Trump, suppose, you know, so maybe Trump's approach is too blunt, uh, we were to think about how are we going to, uh, in a reasonable, rational way, reform the international order uh, so that it actually functions better, uh, you know, what really should be the priority? What are the key areas for reform? What kinds of new arrangements are needed to better address emerging problems? Over here, Jim. Uh, I'm like the least, um, like, capable of answering that question. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I share some of the concern that you expressed on, on the uh, impact of the Trump administration uh, on, on the uh, international liberal order or institutions, uh, uh, you know, uh, as you just mentioned, whether it is the UN or, you know, bank or, uh, or UNESCO or, or you know, uh, uh, disarmament, uh, you name it. Uh, and um, that part, I think, uh, we need to sustain. We need to muddle through. And, uh, and I, uh, that's what uh, the, uh, to be honest, for the time being, we continue to, to keep, keep it, uh, we, with the support of a country like Europe and some Asians who share the same values. Really. Uh, and uh, uh, that includes, uh, you know, trade regime like TPP. And, mm -hmm. and uh, for the moment, uh, so we, I personally distinguish uh, very tr Trump unique policy and uh, and uh, general American tendency and uh, to to I don't say withdraw but uh, reorganize the priority uh, of American policy and uh, there are those elements uh, which is uniquely pushed uh, by this Trump administration uh, if, if that is the case if you have a political shift, and these, uh, these could be shifted. But there are some other elements like uh, United States don't want to see all these forces, uh, you know, uh, deployed around the world, including Afghan and Middle East uh, and whatever the places. I think that is natural because I think uh, uh, there is a legitimate, uh, I would say, demand or concerned on the part of American people that Americans are spending too much. I mean, unilaterally uh, to protect the other friends and allies, actually. And uh, so uh, when the government uh, told the NATO countries that uh, you need to speed up your, your defense effort, uh, I think that's a legitimate uh, request. Uh, although that is uh, causing some strains, that is true. But as a result, I think many European uh, countries decided to increase the defense spending. Uh, that itself is not a bad thing. But when, it, when that is done without any serious political lift. And uh, in Japan-US context, of course, I mean, uh, there is a benign, I would say, uh, hope that American government uh, would like to see Japanese government uh, uh, spending more on the defense. And that is actually what the uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is doing buying more American aircraft and, and spending more money and, and so forth. But it's not for the sake of America's, uh, you know, spending less. It's for the sake of ourselves. We need to catch up our defense effort. We recognize that not simply uh, in comparison to what the Chinese is doing, 
the level of spending. I think uh, we need to do more as a legitimate reason uh, for our own self. So we shouldn't make those issues as a uh, uh, central part of dispute. We don't have to do it. And, uh, and so, um, and also uh, we welcome Americans' uh, uh, resources uh, distributions uh, uh, more uh, toward the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, uh, age area or so. Uh, there was a lot of talk of rebalancing, pivoting, and all, all the things. But for the first time, some years, there was actual deliberately uh, uh, not only spending, but also the deployment and so forth. So uh, there is a positive part of that. But when it comes to uh, a traditional liberal order, as uh, Jim just mentioned, those parts are declining and weaker part of the United States policy today. So for, for that, I think the others need to support. Can I say, I'd like to say something about this. I, I'm a little bit more concerned um, along the lines of your question that there's a bipartisan conclusion that U.S. foreign policy on a range of issues uh, in the economic and diplomatic sphere have been a failure. I, I don't agree that they've been a failure. We've heard some of it here today about the failure of this or the lack of real re realism in, in various other proposals by the United States. But if you look at uh, the rise of China as a challenge that's best de dealt with multilaterally, and I think it is, along the lines that Ambassador Sasai laid out so well, um, I'm concerned that there's a kind of bipartisan consensus that multilateral initiatives of the United States in the past have been a failure. Mm. Uh, it's certainly the case about TPP. Um, you know, if you look at the candidates in 2016, uh, President Trump ran against TPP. President uh, President uh, candidate uh, uh, Sanders was even more adamant against TPP, and Secretary Clinton abandoned TPP during the campaign and said that she would never support it, uh, even though when she was Secretary of State, she said that it was the gold standard of international agreements, and I agree it was the gold standard. And it, it flows from a view of the WTO. The WTO was a good thing, and China joining the WTO was a good thing. And I can defend that position at some length, but I won't do it here. I'll just assert that that's the case. It was good for the United States. It was good for the region. The problem with the WTO is it didn't go far enough for in a globalized world to deal with the many challenges that are created by transnational production chains and the flows of finance. And that's what the TPP was designed to deal with. So you, what you needed a, as a higher standard uh, WTO, not scrapping of the existing one. And what we got in American politics, again, not just from the Trump administration, but especially strongly in the Democratic Party, is that trade deals were a bad deal for America, whether it be NAFTA or WTO or anything else. And if anything, the Democratic Party is more anti-trade than, than the Trump administration version of the Republican Party. And I don't know who can salvage that in the current political environment, so I'm quite concerned about it. Um, and then in terms of defense, uh, I agree with what Ambassador Sasai said that you know, the, uh, a high price for peace will quickly be forgotten if there's war, uh, because war will be much, much more costly than the investment in the uh, deterrence capabilities of the United States, which I strongly believe in. Um, but again, it would be very helpful to have a persistent message to our allies uh, in Asia and elsewhere that we're there for a reason, we're there to stay, and we will respond to the growth of potential challenges with increased military strength. And I don't see a bipartisan consensus on that issue either. Um, so I'm concerned about the nature of American politics. And I'll just close by saying this, that I really see the United States right now as becoming increasingly whiny <laughs> about international conditions. The United States has done extremely well. The world is more peaceful than it's ever been before. There's less hunger in the world than ever before. Um, uh, there is a tremendous amount of success in the economy and elsewhere. And you would think that the entire world was on fire and that the policies that the United States have raised in East Asia have been naive, uh, destructive maybe even, and uh, incredibly uh, unsuccessful. 
And just look at China. They're rising, and we haven't done anything about it. Well, China's been rising for over 30 years. The last time China used a military force in anger was 1988 against Vietnam. The last time it fought a war was 1979, a war it didn't win. I would suggest that a country like China that's rising as dramatically as it's been rising over the last 30 years, with so many sovereignty disputes on its border that hasn't used force, is probably a country that has been affected by a successful set of policies by the countries around it. And I think those policies have been a success. As Ambassador Sasai said, we need to strengthen them, not scrap them. And I'm concerned that my country doesn't recognize the successes that it's had. It only sees problems and it panics. And I hope we don't panic. So uh, just to keep things interesting, I think one of the uh, implications of Jim's argument is that perhaps uh, U.S. policy should be more tolerant of nuclear proliferation uh, to especially countries like Japan that have strong civil-military relations, unlikely to be a proliferator, uh, democracy, and so forth. I don't know if you'd extend the argument to mm -hmm. countries like North Korea. Uh, but, you know, should the U.S. policy on proliferation change uh, now? The, has the cost-benefit analysis that prevailed after World War II shifted now to a point uh, where this should be a serious part of the discussion in places like the United States and Japan? Um, so uh, I think the, that the non-proliferation regime is breaking down. It's doing so slowly. Uh, I would prefer that it not break down. I would prefer that that neither Japan nor North Korea nor any other states acquire nuclear weapons. And my in my ideal world, no state has them, and it's peaceful. But these are not uh, almost all of those are not well. Uh, you know, a number of those are not realistic. I, I think it's unrealistic to think, or I'm more pessimist, much more pessimistic about the prospect of a denuclearized North Korea. Uh, you know, except with a regime change there. Um, uh, which we can't do, can't do a whole lot to influence, but, uh, you know, maybe marginally over, over potentially a long, a, long, uh, a lot of time. Um, so, so, yeah, so I'd prefer that none of these, you know, I'd prefer that, for example, J Japan not go nuclear, as, you know, I guess most people in Japan would also strongly prefer. Uh, but, you know, both here and, I guess, you know, in reply to your, your last question, Again, I think a lot of the, it just depends so much on China and, and developments in China, and, and in particular kind of internal developments which, uh, which we can't really forecast and uh, um, could go all kinds of, you know, could go in, in very different directions. So um, I do think that U.S. security commitment is one of the basic issues, and this is partially the current question but partially the last one. Basically, one, another way of putting what I was saying is that Increasingly, U.S. security commitments in Asia are just overextended relative to our interests. And I have a hard time seeing, uh, you know, Tom was just mentioning we should keep up with deterrence. Deterrence of what exactly? How is the American public going to feel about running nuclear risk over Senkaku Daoyus uh, or some other tiny little rocks in the in South China Sea? Like, that would be insane. I mean, I think even running new serious nuclear risk over Taiwan is 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 uh, would be a, a tough a tough uh, one for the American public. Um, uh, so so there's just this overextended problem, which makes I think the system there brittle, and you know, and again, it's brittle with respect to what? With re respect to these hard to anticipate developments I with China. Um, uh, I think probably the most likely thing is that they will. I mean, you mentioned a long a long history of China not being, you know, particularly inclined to use force uh, abroad. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, I, d I don't know that I'd give all the credit to the neighbors in the U.S. there. Um, I think it's a, you know, broader set of, uh, of reasons, but that's true. Uh, um, so, you know, in ter you know we, we quite very well be kind of continually, continue to kind of muddle along in this uh, or, or go along with these you know, ha the same set of institutions hanging around uh, uh, and, uh, you know, 
maybe we'll be able to get back on track with kind of coordination of a balancing uh, coalition, you know, via TPP. Uh, hopefully we can take that in a more multilateral direction. Uh, uh, so, so I'm not against the kind of things you're, you're talking about, but I do wonder whether, I do think that there's this underlying, there are these underlying uh, trends, which mean that the, a lot of the premises of the way uh, you're talking and Ambassador Sasse, I, I worry that those are kind of shifting out from under us. Yeah, uh, I think that's a very uh, interesting uh, debate. So may I ask you a question? Uh, so what does, do you think the United States should do? I mean, what is the goal? I mean, what, if the United States would simply reduce uh, the commitment and uh, letting China play with the Taiwan, the same kaku, South China, whatever you see, and that is a small box and so forth. It's the uh, United States is not a major interest. And then China would come on board and dominate. It doesn't hurt the United States. Is that your image and goal of the United States uh, in the region? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the I, I, it's hard for me to imagine mm -hmm. that the uh, the uh, you know or uh, you know okay, uh, unless there's like some real collapse, economic collapse, and big big changes, um, continued even like three percent growth in China, uh, and continued military development, they're going to have a dominant position in the South China Sea. I mean they already they already do, and like and who's and and, and they uh, that can be accomplished uh, without kind of by fait accompli and without uh, without ever having to. Um, you know, use force to change the status quo, really. Um, uh, I think that a lot of the questions here, I mean, or, or that, that follow from, the, the, you know, if, if, if there's something right about what I said, the things that we need to worry about are not the kind of World War II, World War, you know, the, the conventional world concerns about uh, actual territorial conquest. But, but rather, the fears are more on the economic side. And so a lot of the discussion these days is, you know, Belt and Road and so on, and that, you know, China is, a pro is, is gonna be this massive, already is a massive economy, gonna be even more massive, uh, and that's gonna be just this, you know, powerful gravitational force, which is, uh, you know, uh, combined with a way of thinking, a, a, a non-liberal, mercantilist approach uh, that, and that that's the real threat. Uh, they'll make all these states in the region their, their economic slaves somehow, vassal states and so on. Um, I, you know, this is a little out, this is outside, this is what we call IPE, and, and I'm, I don't feel um, confident. Uh, I mean, I, I'm basically kind of a little skeptical about the way that's, th that discussion has, I'm very skeptical about how far the pendulum swung on that. It seems like a lot of you guys who are experts are also like, look, we shouldn't view China as the Borg uh, from, what was that show? Uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, you can imagine, I hope. But anyway, the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it, are there historical examples of states that have really done absolutely great economically for themselves uh, with mercantilist, you know, Policies don't we kind of think that mercantilist policies are not so sure they're actually uh, necessarily going to be super successful? So anyway, so I, I think a lot of the, the issues are really more on the uh, the um, economic side. On the other hand, if uh, you know something happens in China that makes them want to invade Taiwan or seize uh, the Senkaku Daoyus, you know, uh, then I think you know there there would be this pressure put. Uh, an acute pressure put on on the U.S. would have to say like, okay, what are we going to do? And there, I have, I mean, when we think about the balance of interest in, in in those situations, I don't think it favors the U.S. All right, shall we uh, open the floor to questions? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up the nuclear question which you asked, Philip, which 
and maybe take it back to Rio, who doesn't want to deal with this. But anyway, in your, <laughs> in that uh, four options that you gave, there were several of them that involve U.S. retreat. And so I think most people, when they think about Japan op going nuclear, they think about it not as something that a Japan that's still living within the San Francisco system would ever contemplate. They think about it as a consequence of uh, the retreat of the United States, and it sort of goes back to what Jim was talking about earlier. I mean, if you don't have any choice, uh, nuclear weapons actually have a certain efficacy. So under what, I the, given those four scenarios you laid out, which one of them leads to, in, in which one of them does Japan begin to see the inexorable logic of having its own nuclear deterrent? Thank you. And because of political sensitivity, I really don't want to uh, answer directly about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Uh, but uh, yeah, thank you for that very, how can I say, enlightening uh, conversation, especially uh, from uh, Professor Jim Fiaron's uh, provocative speech. But I think uh, if I, I think at the moment of when, theoretical moment, of when Japan really uh, go nuclear is of course, you know, US uh, credibility for explicit deterrence is totally destroyed. Uh, and uh, maybe as uh, Professor Fiaron said, uh, Senkaku issue uh, could be one trigger for that. I mean, to destroy uh, the any kind of uh, credibility on Japan side. And of course, uh, if we, I employ my own uh, scenario or four models, imagine China-Japan rivalry is the one, you know, when Japan go nuclear. Uh, but as I said uh, first, I really don't think this scenario <coughs> will be uh, real realistic because uh, e even if Japan, uh, you know, uh, feel uh, no credibility on the uh, China's, uh, on the U.S. side, uh, just by having a go nuclear, I mean nuclear weapons by itself, uh, it might not be enough to deter against the Chinese more aggression, you know, if uh, we don't have any deterrence uh, from the U.S. side. So uh, going to nuclear is not only by normative reason or cultural reason, but also by realistic reason, it couldn't be a good option uh, for Japan uh, as uh, internal balancing. So, um, uh, so I, and in other scenario, I don't think, you know, Japan, they want to consider uh, nuclear options. So uh, I still don't think, uh, you know, it is really feasible uh, Japan uh, decide uh, such a things in the future. The alternative to bandwagon then is China. So as I said, sinicization might be more possible if U.S. dear literature and credibi no credibility with the United from the United States and uh, no deterrence uh, will be provided by the United States. The only way or the more likely uh, scenario for me at least is sinicization. But Japan tried to resist under that system, a China-led system. That is more, and uh, that is less costly uh, for Japan's its own survival. Uh, Steve Krasner, political science and FSI. So let me give you a dystopian view, and I want any of you guys in the panel to tell me why it's wrong. <laughs> so it's, has the U.S. done well? Well, not that well. It fell five places in the UN Human Development Index since 1990. Life expectancy of poorly educated whites in the U.S. is declining. The most likely, most likely outcome for China would be that we'll kind of stall out, that we've never had an autocratic regime that really became rich, and there are good theoretical reasons for that. So we l if we look at Professor Sahashi's uh, two-by-two table, you had this description on, you had one of your options was kind of in the lower right where there's kind of free riding. Well, free riding by everybody, why not just call it the 1930s without war? And that, that's where we're headed. The U.S. won't be able to sustain where it's been in the past. China will not continue to grow. There will be no dominant power. There will be regional powers. We will return to mercantilism because there'll be no way to stop that. There'll be no great power that will see it, see it as being in its interest to do that. And what we'll end, with, end up with is the 1930s mercantilism without war. Why is that wrong? <laughs> Why without war? Well, because for the reasons that Jim said, because you have nuclear weapons. So could you imagine a Nazi Germany again invading the Soviet Union? <laughs> Probably not with nuclear weapons, but you can really? certainly imagine 
Mercantilism. Okay, I don't know what you mean. Retail blocks. <laughs> Why am I wrong? <laughs> you want to say something? Please. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, you could imagine whatever the scenario, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you could write a different kind of novel, I mean, to be honest, if you could uh, say uh, everybody is in power lives and, and uh, no uh, single uh, determined power in place, Americans are power lives, uh, don't care about the others, and uh, Japan's are torpedoes and, and try to go for the nuclear weapon if there is not sufficient deterrence extended by the United States, and we don't want to be allied with China, we don't want to be dominated by the Chinese way of ruling, could Russia be dependent upon it? Well, uh, you know, it looks like uh, back in 1930s, right? So that's what uh, nobody wants. If that is the case, I think that should be a more realistic way of doing it. Yeah, I just say, Steve, that, that, that would be really bad. <laughs> 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 I don't. I don't see us heading in that direction, but it would be really bad if it were. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that the United States will uh, maintain its alliance commitments, and uh, we talk about the. Ex Based on what? Based on more than your optimism. Well, more than my. I mean, there, there are obje you can, there are certain objective measures that that people uh, leave out of these debates. For example, the United States spends less on the military as a percentage of GNP than it did for most of the Cold War, including in the 1980s at a time when it was growing very quickly. This idea that we're spending ourselves into oblivion uh, is, again, I think much more of a sign of our whininess than it is of our uh, actual economic capacities. I think that the, um, the uh, tragic, uh, you know, opioid crisis in America is much more responsible for those death rates than uh, our China policy or our alliance policies in Japan. Um, I think we have huge problems in our education system that are uh, rooted in things that are p almost entirely domestic. Um, and they're not international. Uh, and I think, again, uh, I don't know. I, I'm the youngest of seven. My father fought in World War II. I think of that generation and what they had to go through to stabilize the international system, and I think about what the current generation of adults has to deal with to enjoy a stable system, and I just can't see the house on fire. Um, I, I just, I don't see it as as bad as other people. I think there are real challenges attendant to China's rise, but they can be handled, and I do think uh, some of the responses at this table about the danger of the United States signaling that it doesn't really care about certain issues that our allies really care about would be part of the unraveling of the system that would leave in that, lead in that direction. And I do think the South China Sea is different than the Senkakus, and it's different than Taiwan, because I think they have much more, um, much stronger implications, Taiwan and, and the Senkakus, for the reputation of the United States to keep its commitments, uh, which I think is a very precious commodity that you don't notice until it goes away and we'd be much more likely to unravel in the direction that you say. Um, uh, it is dystopian. Um, I don't see how it could really lead to peace, and I guess I disagree that Hitler would have been deterred if he had nuclear weapons. Uh, and this, uh, I just, if you know, Russia had nuclear weapons? If, you're, if Russia had nuclear weapons, I don't think he would have been deterred. Uh, this is why nuclear deterrence theory is, is a great rational choice theory, but um, it, it requires rational people. Um, I don't put Hitler in that category. I don't believe he was a terrible, and I said this to, to Jim earlier today, I think it's a tragedy in our field that the classic example of deterrence failure is Munich. Uh, Hitler was not the terrible, he preferred war to peace, and we should come up with a better example of deterrence failure than Hitler. Do you think he would have marched towards Moscow under the threat of complete destruction of Berlin and every other city in Germany? That happened. Um, slowly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's happened slowly, so it would have happened more quickly. Yeah, no, I, yeah, uh, I think I think he made a, a series of thermonuclear weapons. Well, because of the speed, I don't know. No, I mean, he ended up shooting it's himself it's in a bunker. The outcome was pretty bad for him. Not a good leader. Fair enough. <laughs> um, I, so, so I think what you're saying could happen. You might not. You might be right. I'd like to know more about what you mean or what what you envision under mercantilism. I guess traditionally we think of that as involving exclusive, like you can only trade with us and you can't trade with others. I'm not, I, I wonder if that's really, um, you know, given what we've, you know, the, the supply, the, 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 way, the way things are now, is that 
Yeah, you know, it, that, those kind of policies in the 30s had, in some cases, secure, well, security rationales, which might not really apply anymore, so, um, or in the same way. Uh, so, you know, is this a cultural argument that the, the Chinese are just addicted to, you know, it's like what they did a thousand years ago or something? Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I'm just not so sure that we get the classical mercantilism even in this scenario. All right. Uh, Jack Mormon, Chairman, U.S. Japan, MedTech Frontiers. So this has been excellent and certainly stimulated my thinking. The uh, focus has been on policy and actions by government. But what I'm, I guess, interested in the panel's opinion, uh, uh, views on, is the effect of this unprecedented change in the demographics of the population that is either voting for or supporting the various governments. This is, of course, the aging unemployed population in Japan, increase in the U.S., and, of course, uh, it'll be a, an epic crisis when China's aging population finally moves up into where they're no longer working but start part of the infrastructure. So we talked about, you have talked about the policies, uh, but those policies presumably are affected by the people who are executing or implementing them, and those are presumably at least our two countries that you're talking about voted for. Now we have a population that will be, what, maybe 40% of the Japanese voting will be over the age of 65 and not working, uh, some less but significant percentage in the U.S. So what kind of people are they going to elect? Are they going to continue one of these scenarios? Are they going to care? Are they going to be isolationist? Uh, where are we going with this? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> 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 <All right, okay. laughs> uh, yeah. Whatever the questions, uh, I was a diplomat. So diplomats work to answer to whatever the question. Uh, I think this uh, issues of uh, aging populations, and also I would plus uh, income, income, uh, you know, inequality and distribution of wealth issues. These are the common challenges. I mean, not simply, uh, you know, in the United States, Japan, or Russia, China, uh, Western Europe, wherever you go. I mean, uh, except for uh, some growing population like India. India, even uh, this income redistribution issues there. So, um, and uh, this is uh, threatening. Uh, governance. I mean, and, and this uh, this issue threaten both dictatorial and the democratic governance. I say even Russia say uh, Putin's popularity is going down because uh, uh, Russian's economy is, uh, is uh, income gap is growing, middle class is frustrated, and. Uh, and in China, I think, uh, you know, although uh, they continue to grow and slowing down, but if you look at the disparity of the income, it's growing. Even in Japanese society, uh, it's not simply the aging issues, but are, uh, you know, the, uh, all these uh, rich and poor issues. We are basically egalitarian uh, society, top executive not getting that uh, income, but still. I think if you look, look at the margins of middle class, it is uh, gradually shrinking. So um, this is an uh, issue uh, not really taken as a geopolitical matter. It's an issue of how each sovereignty could govern. And if this is not really addressed, the tendency is that they would blame the others, and especially the other countries and the other ethnic groups and try to create the tensions and confrontation that we need to avoid. And uh, in Japanese context, I think a uh, good part is that uh, we are a bit behind in terms of uh, introducing foreign labors and upgrading the role of women. And we are trying to catch up, but still uh, lying behind. And the only uh, you know, good part is uh, the, the you know, level uh, but disparity of income is less than what we see uh, uh, in the United States and even uh, in China. So there is a less tension to that. 
But as we see growing, I think there is more issues of the challenge of the people about, about the government and the governance, I would say. I think there, there is an increasing this issues, and this is a common issue. That's, that's the area where I think um, countries, including China, US, Japan, and G20, whatever, the Europe, could talk. What, are, what can we do? And it's not an easy thing, stuff. But this could be discussed, not uh, in a, in a zero-sum confrontational, which side is winning or losing, and, and so forth. This is a common issue. Unless we could address these issues, and uh, each country would face an enormous problem. Thank you, Ambassador. But uh, I, al I always respect seniority, so Ambassador first. But uh, <laughs> my, my just a very brief answer to demographic question is, I think, uh, uh, you know, um, in data years, uh, you know, like a decades or a few decades, I think uh, uh, just as a political scientist, I predict it might be more difficult for uh, Japanese authority to keep kind of consensus view on uh, San Francisco system or enhanced San Francisco, San Francisco system because for that matter, Japan has to increase its own defense resources uh, or like a, uh, just only budget, but also, you know, they have to uh, uh, prov provide more resources for the uh, national defense. But I think, you know, uh, for the younger shrinking population, uh, that might be a difficult choice and, and also the budgetary constraints uh, might ask them to spend more for social welfare system. And also they try to care more about regionalizations of economic activities in Asia. So I think uh, maybe policy makers want to keep the same policy. I mean, they still prefer the first choice. I mean, as I said, enhanced San Francisco system, but uh, uh, the consensus view uh, in domestic society could be difficult to be sustained. I'll just uh, add, uh, so Yo Yoichi Funabashi has written about this and you know, his argument is that the elderly in Japan have a somewhat more pacifist view and so that might contribute to foreign policy. Uh, David Weinstein from Colombia uh, was here uh, a few months ago and, and he actually showed uh, sort of the trajectory of the Japanese public debt. And one of the concerns about aging in Japan was that you know, the elderly would vote, vote, vote themselves benefits and it would explode the debt. And it turns out that Japan's had actually done a pretty good job limiting spending on the elderly and increasing taxes over time. And so the kind of great fears that aging would result in political catastrophe and budgetary catastrophe in Japan haven't uh, come uh, true. So that might be one encouraging data point if you're interested. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to thank Steve for raising the two by two. I've been thinking about the two by two table. Uh, <coughs> uh, and I could talk in detail about each of the, but I won't. I'll simply ask you if this is part of ongoing research and you publish, maybe you already have published this. I think it would be important to do a couple of things. First of all, to identify your order of preference, which is the best outcome, the second best and so forth. And is the lower right quadrant, you know, the freeloaders, is that really worse than cynicization and resistance? You know, that sounds pretty violent as well. So that would be number one. My assumption is that enhanced SM SF si system, the San Francisco system, would be your first choice, but you might want to clarify that. And then second, what is the probability that each of these outcomes will occur? Mm. Uh, and third, which of these four outcomes is likely to be the most stable, enduring over time, okay? And then if I could just briefly shift uh, to, to Jim. Um, yeah, that was a remarkable presentation. I must say as, a, as, a, as an academic, I especially appreciated uh, the abstraction. <laughs> you know, that was uh, very stimulating. And I think the most stimulating thing that you said, you said a number of things, I, I tried to take uh, notes, is that unipolarity is a policy. It's not a structure. I always thought it was a structure. Bipolarity, you know, two, I mean, it, maybe that's because I'm taking a metaphor too seriously and it. No, that's what most people think. 
but there's a difference, obviously, which I think is very much present in our current situation, including the idiot in the White House, a difference between structure and agency. Now, you know, when, when Tom bemoans the lack of multilateral arrangements that could, you know, contain the possibility of violence and so forth, uh, confidence building mechanisms and all of that, he's talking about a structure. Uh, and the question here is whether we live in a world of agency and the agency that is being modeled in Washington is notable. Um, it's sort of, it's, it's narcissism for one thing, which is the opposite, I mean, it retreating into your own ego, right? Um, and also complete unreliability and attention deficit disorder, we could go on and on. And if there is an authoritarian shift among a number of uh, countries around the world, then agency really looms very large and dangerously so. And it's in this context that I wanted to query you a little bit on your emphasis on nuclear weapons. We're on the edge of AI, whatever that means. You know, the, uh, the topic of the month is 5G, right? Nuclear weapons are a 20th century, at least historically, phenomenon. They can, they're still around, of course, and it is possible that, that proliferation will continue, that it's impossible to stop proliferation. It's even possible to imagine that you will have nuclear weapons that are under the AI category. You can put them in your pocket, you know, when you board the subway, and if you forget to take them with you, maybe there's a timer there and they go off anyway. I mean, you know, one can uh, invent a variety of futures, but all of these futures emphasize technology and the role of technology, right? Who cares if it's difficult to invade a country and take and keep land, you know, if the country has nuclear weapons? I mean, I suppose the classic example would be Pakistan and India, right? That's all about land. I mean, uh, you mentioned the invasion of Vietnam, 1979, right? That was land. But in 1988, it was water. It was the South China Sea. And arguably, the conflicts of the future will be generated much more in that medium, the medium of, of water. I know these are huge issues that we're not going to resolve in the next couple of minutes, but I wonder if you would comment on this distinction between structure and agency and whether we're moving towards a less and less structured world in which agency is going to perhaps exponentially increase the risk. Uh, well, on the, uh, the what about AI, I, I'm not sure I followed entirely. I mean, I think that the, the fundamental uh, revolutionary, the, the, the thing that, I, I don't think the AI is going to have anything to do with undoing the nuclear revolution. Um, uh, the, the key feature of it being, you know, quite low, co low cost for an advanced industrial state to develop an ability to, uh, you know, obliterate another country without having to defeat their, uh, defeat any, any military, uh, you know, to go through an army. Um, you say, who cares if it's hard to take land? That's actually super important uh, because if you live in a world where you can be invaded and, and tanks can roll into Berlin, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, if, if they have more than you, then we saw, you know, this European arms race culminates in the first half of the 20th century with total war and total mobilization. If you, you know, read, they realized with World War I that the next one is, you know, who wins because it's going to depend on whether you can mobilize your whole economy and your whole society. And that's as uh, David Kennedy was actually referring to this uh, this morning. It was quite interesting. That's, we don't, we don't worry about that anymore. We, like, uh, uh, you know, no, the, the advanced industrial states don't have draft, you know, we, we, we don't have these huge reserve forces. Our societies are less militarized than ever. Uh, uh, and, you know, read, you know, James Sheehan wrote this terrific book, Where Have All the Soldiers Gone? It's just a radical change. So, you know, in a world where the leaders have to worry about, like, invasion by land, that's just a very different world. So and I think it's, and it's uh, a world with all kinds of, uh, consequences which we've just uh, we've ceased to be able to see because it's you know uh, you know we only see what's around us Can I say some about maritime disputes which uh, makes me more optimistic maybe than Jim as well that I think the Senkaku Diaoyu dispute between Japan and China is ultimately manageable without massive war um, and one of the reasons is that 
there's really no first mover advantage on a conventional level in that environment. No one lives there. And, uh, and taking over the, uh, the islands is no advantage. I, I, I do, I, long before I was in the government and had clearances, I did uh, war games uh, in Asia f you know, as a kind of uh, advisory thing for the government. And I went to one of these unclassified games. And they told me that I was the red team leader. I was going to be the, the leader of China for this unclassified game. And uh, was the dispute was over Senkaku uh, Islands uh, and the Diaoyu dispute. And they said, the game starts with your, sp your Chinese special forces on one of the islands. What's your first move? And I said, I get my special forces off of the island. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I plant a flag before I leave. <laughs> but I don't keep them there because there's only goats there. How do you keep them alive? You know, and it's and, and so at the South China Sea, too. Uh, I think it was Carl Eikenberry who, who taught me the phrase, great powers don't fight over rocks. Um, so um, so I, I think it's avoidable. There will be tensions over these things. There could even be shooting over these things, but I don't expect a kind of escalation, even in the way that we had for World War I over, uh, over the South China Sea or the East. Taiwan is a different matter. I really do worry about Taiwan because there are people there, and people are always the issue, right? People on both sides of the strait, and then the United States commitment, which is intentionally a bit ambiguous. It's a very complicated issue, and I'm afraid it's going to get more complicated in the next several months uh, as we head towards another election. So I worry about Taiwan, and I think it is different. I do think reputation matters, and I think that it is a manageable problem, but it's a difficult problem to manage. Can I ask you just a, qu a question on the Senkaku Dayus? What, uh, and it's really a question for um, uh, our Japanese colleagues. What do you think would happen to Japanese public opinion if you know crazy stuff happens in China and they decide to seize it? What would, how would that affect Japanese public opinion? Would, would people, would they go, oh, would they say, oh, sinicization? Too bad, or or would there be really radical change? Okay, this uh, time maybe first? Yeah, younger first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, my own layman's perspective on that is, uh, uh, I really don't think you know uh, Chinese actions uh, to detect Senkaku Islands cannot be uh, on the own uh, five islands uh, un un uninhabited uh, uh, five islands in Senkaku area. They may expand at least conventional level to other. Uh, inhabited islands in the area of southwestern islands. That is, you know, our concern. So, you know, even at conventional level, uh, you know, other uh, islands uh, with some population might be naturally involved uh, in the game. And also for China side, uh, if they really want to defend um, after taking the Senkaku Islands, they may want to deter uh, U.S. involvement in that islands. Uh, in the islands they take, they took. Uh, so uh, they may uh, poss possibly uh, attack uh, some US bases in the area or Japan bases in the area. So I think uh, even at conventional level, we have to uh, go beyond on the Senkaku area. Well, I think we have to defend Japan proper, but China doesn't claim Japan proper. So it just doesn't, I mean, uh, if it attacks Japan proper, it's going to be a very different world than if it. Yeah, it, yeah, tries yeah. To, it tries to consolidate its long-held claims to the, uh, what they yeah. call the Diaoyu. Yeah, so that, that is just based on a scenario which, which we imagine. But, you know, my point and my answer to a general question is if the such expansion happens, Japan's public opinion is totally, you know, anger. Yeah. And, you know, and the escalation might go into the, you know, high ladder. But if that doesn't happen, that is a different. different. So, so unfortunately, we are out of time, so that will have to be the last word. But the intellectual brawling can continue over alcohol. Uh, oh, my understanding is that uh, we have a reception coming up. So uh, if uh, uh, Carl, would you uh, like to make the announcement? Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for the great uh, panel. Uh, it's been a great day. So uh, what I'd recommend, we're going to take just five minutes to give our uh, two rapporteurs a moment to uh, collect their thoughts from this uh, third and final session. So I'd stay close uh, here. Uh, and at 525, then, we'll introduce our two rapporteurs. They're going to sit here and give a very quick readout of the three sessions of what they thought were the, uh, the big insights. We're going to then turn to uh, the participants that we've got, the panelists, and ask them very briefly if they think that uh, something was missed there that they'd like to uh, add to. And then Ambassador Sasai and myself will uh, close this out. And our goal 
is to a transition at 545 to a reception, which is open to the uh, public, open to everybody here out in the foyer. So let's be back in just five minutes. Thank you. I think about that. I think that in the previous session, yeah. Sasai, uh, the chairman Sasai, uh, 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 shared the one perspective that we don't so compare so much or worry so much about BRI at this stage because, uh, you know, uh, that's got to be changed. But I don't mean it necessarily yeah. as a threat. I mean, like, best case scenario so for Japan, like, how could, would you be okay if yeah. that how could it be, like, proactively increased? Like, do you see a scenario in which uh, it could help? If it is thickened in that portion, the strength of the network of, of interactions, not just China going out to the hub, but different countries <laughs> interacting together. Or do you think it would yeah, absolutely yeah, be yeah, yeah. smoke and spoke? Actually, you know that 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 is put, that is that might be beyond BRI. But uh, in China, uh, they start to discuss, as you know, uh, kind of a security partnership discussion by Tsinghua University people, right? Mm -hmm. So like that, like a US USA talk. Uh, Name is U.S. Tone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that their argument is like that China should have a very, you know, uh, strong security partnership, like alliance level. Mm -hmm. right? If you know, like BRI, uh, will not not maybe BRI, but uh, if China really start to make that kind of stronger partnership, or they start to militarize some yeah. economic partnership, that might be a different issue. But at this moment, we don't find that element from BRI. Of course, we argued very journalistically in the last few years, mm -hmm. but I think at this moment, BRI is still shapeable uh, by other countries. So, but to predict, to predict the future, I think uh, the militarizations of economic aid, assistance, and Chinese more approach towards stronger security partnership with some key countries yeah, might be the issue. Yeah, when you look at all the ports, is there? But port itself is not. So not important. necessarily. Yeah, yeah. But, but it can be. Can be, can be, can be. Yeah. But uh, what I personally worry more is uh, stronger military partnership uh -huh. beyond just using port. Uh -huh. So are you spending some time in your research looking at this? Or is it yeah, sometimes, yes. Yeah. And you're based in Tokyo? Yeah. I, I, I'm from University of Tokyo. Can I get your card? Oh, yeah, of course. I, so I'm working on a BRI series right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll be going to the region in a couple of summers. So yeah. if you're around. Yeah, yeah. Want to talk a bit more? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, you can come to my office. At, and when uh, I'm not uh, working on journalistic things, I teach journalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks. Really nice to meet you. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting. You forgot to mention that um, that uh, China has some um, latent irredentist claims on the reaccused. So uh, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that the, 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 yeah. they're, they're, they're developing, but, you know, but, as a, as but, a backup. But yeah. not, not only DQ, DQ mm. independence, mm. but also, you know, some islands like uh, Miyako and Shigaki. Oh, uh, uh, really? And Shimojishima, you know. Well, you, you really fear that they're going, to, um, yeah. they're going to discover some document some, you know, somewhere in the archives that yeah. says that you know, fishermen yeah. were there and so forth, uh, or rather fabricated, and, <laughs> you know, and then so they've discovered it. <laughs> Soon they'll be posting YouTube videos saying the whole world wants to know why <laughs> <laughs> Japan is occupying our <laughs> islands. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> the bill. And if you think about it, there's a conflict over around Senkaku. Um, it would only take a few bombs to make Senkaku disappear in the first place, and there'd be nothing left to fight over. If you drop a few, you know, mother of all bombs on there, he's going to dis destroy it anyway. So. Gosh. Um, 
think of this right, right, difficult yeah. for you to summarize everything, right? Of course, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. you've got some difficult questions, you know, very hypothetical and, you know, also have to be a bit diplomatic, but yeah, I think you did a good job. This is a panel of Stanford, so lovely what it is, right? If we really try to say very frankly, that's not really the issue for Dago, right? So I try to say as podcast yeah. scientists, but yeah, you know, yeah, 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 no, yeah, exactly. So yeah. thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. For defending the. Yeah. 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 So that was actually one of the when we were at the workshop and you gave your presentation, I was like, perfect. And uh, this was superb. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, and I know the stuff on Patreon as well, and I think it intersects a little bit. Um, with what okay, let's go ahead and uh, get seated again. Okay, if we could get uh, started here. Okay, those still standing and talking are standing between the audience and a glass of wine right now. Um, so uh, what we'd like to do then, we have two uh, great rapporteurs. They're both senior fellows at uh, the uh, JIA. And uh, they have had uh, both very distinguished academic careers. I won't go into those. Those are in the uh, program. But we have Jonathan Berkshire Miller, and we have Thomas Wilkins. I'm going to turn to them. They'll work their way through the three sessions very briefly. And again, looking just for some of the insights, this should help all of us to think about what our takeaways uh, from today <coughs> might be. Uh, and it will help them immensely as they are the ones that are going to prepare under the rule of non-attribution, Chatham House rule, they will be the ones that are drafting the workshop report. So after they finish, very briefly, if anyone here that was one of the panelists or, or key participants, say from A Park, JIA, if you have anything that was glaring that's uh, missing from this, uh, otherwise, you can wait until the, uh, the reception or the dinner and talk to the uh, two rapporteurs there as well. So, Jonathan and Thomas. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. Um, i uh, just like to thank uh, Stanford and uh, APARC for hosting us for this very timely symposium. Uh, my job is to comment on the past and the future, panel one and panel three. So I'm going to try and peer back into the past and then into the future, bypassing the present, which Jonathan will come back to in the end. So just imagine that we're in a time machine and we're going back to the future. So, so join me as I you know, seamlessly transition between the past and the future, panel one and, and, uh, and panel three. Of course, it's impossible to do full justice to uh, these two panels and the, two, the eight presenters therein and synergize this with, uh, with all of the overall symposium objectives as well as the, um, the uh, audience feedback. Uh, but I'll, I'll do the best I can um, now that I've given you enough caveats for why I can't do it. Um, so um, I think what I wanted to do was sort of take a thematic approach uh, rather than just run through the papers one by one. We'll, we'll never have time to do that. So um, three themes that I think connect the past uh, potentially with the future. Um, the first is the continued importance of history, um, that history is very much still in the room for a number of reasons. Uh, secondly, the centrality of the role played by the United States as the uh, primary, uh, the, uh, the primary power in the, the Asia Pacific or the regional hegemon. And lastly, this idea that we've um, come to potential critical junctures um, in the, the future. And my, so, oops. Yeah. So um, the first one to, uh, to talk about is the, uh, the importance of history. Um, a lot of the presenters probe the historical structures representing international order. Um, but I query how effectively we've actually learned these uh, less lessons of history um, for the formation and maintenance of international order going into the future. Particularly, it was pointed out by um, Kawashima-san um, that uh, the Versailles and Washington settlements ended up being faulty systems and uh, becoming incubators of a system-wide war um, in World War II. Um, and so that perhaps should, uh, should caution us that we need to get the, the system right, we need to get the architecture right, the order has to be stable. 
Um, also that historical issues continue to influence the present and the future. Um, it came out on a number of occasions uh, that unresolved historical issues from the San Francisco peace system, the absence of various parties in the peace treaties, uh, the status of Taiwan, Professor uh, Lin talked about, um, you know, are all unresolved uh, issues that continue to uh, plague us uh, in the present and into the future. And it was also mentioned, I think, by uh, Professors Inouye and uh, Christensen um, about um, this, uh, in, the, in the first case, the lack of definitive reconciliation between East Asian states. And Professor Christensen in particular pointed out the troubled bilateral relationship between Japan and um, the Republic of Korea. So those are still other things that live with us um, from a historical perspective. Also, um, this idea um, that uh, dissatisfied or so-called revisionist powers uh, need to be accommodated and people have you know, reached um, instinctively towards China. But India is also, it should be remembered, you know, a, a, a country that is rising and that is dissatisfied in some ways with the prevailing international order, its lack of representation on the P5 and, and many other things. Um, but I think we should also just be a bit careful about, um, you know, um, so, so we should be careful about um, making any kind of security order and the architecture that it's built upon um, inclusive because excluded powers, whether it was in the original peace treaty system or in current projections of international order, lead to caveats and instability. Uh, lastly, I would just say as a, someone who originally was a historian myself, um, but we should just be a little bit perhaps cautious about overwriting historical analogies onto contemporary dynamics. So I've been in a number of places where people have said, oh, okay, well, you know, China should be compared to, rising China should be compared to Germany in the 1910s or something, and then it's got down to, you know, very, very sort of tight um, comparisons that I, I think we have to be a bit cautious about. So let me um, move rapidly on to the, the second major theme that I think has come out of these two panels, which is the centrality of the role played by the United States. It was emphasized by a number of speakers that the United States had to be engaged and committed to um, maintaining um, the, uh, the system, the San Francisco system. This were points that were made by uh, Sahashi-san and Sasai-san as well. Sasai-san was very emphatic that you know, there should be no disengagement by the United States and there was no alternative to a US-led um, system uh, in the region. But uh, Professor Fioron was, uh, was much more pessimistic about this um, and, uh, and, and more, um, uh, more, more skeptical that we'll see a return to normality and we'll see all these things fall back into place once uh, Trump has possibly left the, the White House. Um, another thing about the US role, the so-called hub and spokes um, system. I think uh, Sahashi San sort of alluded to this, but I think there's two elements to the, the US um, hub and spokes or San Francisco alliance system um, that kind of complement each other. So the first we would say from a realist perspective is that it uses military power to, to balance. It's a balance of power uh, based order based upon the alliances. But the San Francisco system and the peace treaty settlement and the sort of the framework that it created after um, uh, World War II is also a normative framework. Um, so it's a set of regional norms that have underwritten peace and stability um, and uh, prosperity, incubated Asian prosperity, um, over a period of years. So in that sense, it also has a liberal or a normative side to it as well. And I think the two are mutually reinforcing, and that's what makes it so durable. Power enough is not, you know, power alone is not enough, but also that, you know, the, the sort of the soft power or the normative side of it. Um, but I would also mention that there's competing systems that we haven't talked about too much. It was only in panel three that, the, uh, that uh, multilateralism and multilateral security architecture was mentioned by Professor Christensen uh, just briefly. But of course, we were sitting in Southeast Asia, we'd be talking all about ASEAN centrality and the ASEAN security community and their suite of, um, of regional organizations. So there is, another, there is another vision for managing the security challenges of the future that, that is you know, distinct but somewhat in, connected in places with the San Francisco system. And then, of course, um, there's the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which hasn't been mentioned and is often overlooked. But this is a, a major element, new element, in the, uh, the regional security architecture and very, I think, um, emblematic of the kind of regional order, the kind of institutions that China wants to build and lead um, in tandem with all of these other things like BRI and AIIB and so forth. 
Um, and in some ways, it sort of provides an alternative. But then at the same time, I think you know China, to a certain degree, benefits, benefits from, but also subverts and attempts to reshape the existing order um, in accord with its own national interests, which is quite understandable for a rising power. So very quickly, um, the, uh, the third theme that I think that came out um, in addition to uh, the centrality of the US um, and the, uh, the continuance of history issues is this idea of a critical juncture, that maybe we've reached this point as we see some structural decline from the United States, exacerbated by political disengagement, and we see a rising China, and we see more proactive um, secondary actors in the region, that we've reached a critical juncture. So, um, Perhaps, as um, was said right at the outset by Professor Kennedy, you know, we are at the moment of a potential paradigm sh shift. He called it a Grotian moment. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, the conversation has revolved around the idea or based upon the assumption that the US is the, the only, or at least the preferred, architect of international order, going back to my, my second theme. But, um, you know, but some people have raised the, um, the question as to whether or not the United States still has the capacity or, or the will to lead and to play this role. So, um, uh, I think uh, you know that we've. Um, this leads us to uh, potential alternatives, and uh, Sahashi-san in particular pointed out something that uh, Jonathan and myself have been become increasingly interested in: is how do non-G2, as in non-China, non-US um, countries within the region, and that would include Japan, but also other so-called middle powers like Australia, Canada, some ASEAN countries, um, South Korea, of course, that are also interested in upholding the US-founded rules-based order, but are disappointed with US disengagement <coughs> and at the same time dis, um, distrust the, uh, the PRC. Um, you know, how do they build alterna alternate <coughs> frameworks together, um, a G3? And so my, my very last point, because although I'm getting the time up signal, my clock says I have 30 seconds, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> um, so the last point is, um, what about um, uh, the, uh, one of the things that's come out as well, right from the, the first panel was that um, China has always been fundamental to East Asian order. You just can't get away from that, even the times where uh, China has been, uh, you know, sort of been submerged in internal conflict. And that China you know, does ha play, a, uh, or could play, or should play a leading role in shaping regional order. In the past, China has been the, the object, um, you know, that the, the, the regional order has sort of, uh, you know, manipulated. But now it's a, it's very much a, an actor uh, in its own right. And so the, um, you know, while we talked a lot about the centrality of the United States, um, we can't ignore that uh, that China has uh, every right and uh, you know and will you know to a, d a degree exercise that right to shape the regional order um, in ways that are um, amenable to its own interests or you know a compromise of interests between all of the powers in the region. Okay, I think that covers everything. <laughs> that <I> <laughs> So uh, I'm going to get you back in the uh, DeLorean, and, and we're, <laughs> we're, uh, we're going to the present now. So the, I've been tasked with the, the, the middle panel, which is panel two on, the, on the, um, the present issues. And in particular, um, I'm going to, similar to Tom, I'm going to look at this in kind of a thematic uh, sense. And kind of uh, while there were so many good discussions on that, I want to look at three key themes that kind of struck, out, uh, that, um, struck me from the, this panel. So the first one that I think uh, came, uh, uh, a lot of the presenters kind of touched on this, was the tensions between uh, U.S. and Japan strategies towards China. So uh, while there was discussion about this, I think it wasn't uh, sometimes uh, as clearly identified, but I think that there was uh, points to this is the difference between the Obama administration's approach towards China and the Trump administration's approach towards China. And I think there was uh, one of the uh, uh, panelists referenced that sometimes uh, with some of the, the harder edge folks that the Trump administration has been taking towards China, uh, there's some patting of the back, uh, some uh, at least privately uh, of the Japanese patting, uh, patting those on the back saying, well, we're looking for, uh, in some senses, a harder edged um, approach. But the conflict of this, I think, comes on uh, at how, how far and how intense uh, should this China policy be. So. I think there was a focus on the articulation, um, uh, whether it's uh, um, on the trade issues or, or even sometimes on the security part. Uh, how far is this articulation going? Uh, I think uh, Jim Schaff mentioned uh, uh, the, the interesting element of the policy consensus in Washington on China. 
Uh, I think uh, Kodani-san also mentioned this, saying that um, this is something that's not shared only in the bureaucracy, but this is something that's, uh, that's been shared in a bipartisan sense in Congress. Um, but I think it was important that Jim mentioned as well that this, perhaps this is not an exclusive uh, uh, feeling in Washington. So while it may appear that everybody's on the same page with China, we're not quite sure that that's exclusive. Um, uh, it's interesting to see, I mean, one of the other uh, points on that, it was the changes in Japan's relationship with China. Um, I think uh, Kotani-san mentioned this in the, uh, embracing the dragon versus um, uh, the Trump administration being seen as the dragon slayer. Uh, so while uh, Japan um, uh, has somewhat stabilized its relationship with China, under the surface some of the, the main drivers of mistrust remain. <laughs> Uh, but it's, uh, it's realized that it needs to engage with China with its eyes wide open and uh, be able to manage those risks. Whereas some of the rhetoric under the Trump administration with its regard, with its engagement with China uh, is much more blunt and uh, has much more of that dragon slayer uh, approach. Uh, a couple of the, the panelists, uh, Professor Lampton and uh, Kotani-san also mentioned this. Um, and I think Sasai-san also re referenced this in, in um, one of the, one of the uh, sessions saying, are we overreacting on China? Uh, so um, is the U.S. going too far? Is there, are, is there an, an articulation of a comprehensive and long-term approach to China? Or is this just looking at different tactical elements? And I think this is one of the, um, the failure of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is one element but it's, it's looking at many different tactical moves that the Trump administration has done that in, in many senses Japan is happy about, whether that's um, uh, more freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, some of the moves they've taken to strengthen relationship with Taiwan, uh, but what does that mean in a more strategic and comprehensive way? Uh, so I think that is uh, some of the uh, elements related to uh, the first theme. The second theme, that which I think uh, has came out and, 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 uh, and uh, evolves from that is the, the convergence and divergence of region on regional strategies, so not in particular the to the relation with China, uh, and, and this basically refers to um, what Japan calls the free and open Indo-Pacific um, vision now, and, uh, and what the United States calls its Indo-Pacific strategy. So how much is FOIP and uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy congruent? Uh, how much should they be? Uh, I think there was even a reference to good cop, bad cop. Uh, is there a way that uh, um, uh, some of the evolution of Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision, which is now more emphasizing uh, the ec infrastructure piece and the economic side, um, uh, how much can that actually uh, work together and interlink with the Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, one thing I should mention, uh, because I get, uh, I get told this each time that I, I reference uh, uh, cooperation with the Belt and Road, uh, there was some reference by the panelists on, on cooperation, uh, Japan being more, um, leaning towards cooperation with Belt and Road, and, and uh, the Japanese diplomats always seem to correct me, saying, "No, there's no cooperation with Belt and Road. It's it's a cooperation in third parties on infrastructure." So they're very quick. So I think this sometimes um, tends to uh, uh, the excitement of of whether there is some sort of movement on uh, Japan-China cooperation in Belt and Road. I think sometimes gets uh, uh, gets reduced when when you hear that. Um, one element that I think we didn't get to on this theme, and I was hoping that there was more discussion on, was uh, where this leads in a minilateral sense. So uh, thinking about the, the, um, the marriage or the connection between FOIP and the Indo-Pacific strategy, what is the role of other actors? So I think Tom kind of referenced this as well. Um, we hinted on this when we talked about Japan's national security strategy, uh, which references uh, working with other partners, but that was one element uh, that, uh, that I think we didn't quite get to. Uh, the last uh, theme before I finish, um, uh, which I think uh, was, was talked about by all the panelists, but especially uh, Jim Bosan and Jim Reshpentis too, was the evolution of the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, so uh, how is the U.S.-Japan alliance um, reacting to uh, changing Chinese security postures and military modernization? Um, uh, and uh, Jimbo Sensei Jimbo mentioned the need for long-term thinking and not just short-term reactionary uh, thinking in this sense. So how can the alliance uh, evolve, not just step-by-step, step, but think about the long-term picture about how, it's, uh, how it will manage Chinese rise. Uh, I very much like the anchor uh, reference that Jim mentioned, so that, uh, rather than using uh, cornerstone or linchpin, um, 
Uh, and I think that uh, Jim and others have showed that uh, Japan, ha Japan plays a key role in U.S. force posture. Um, and, um, and not only that, but Japan's diplomatic and trade efforts, such as l leading on the, TP the TPP-11, uh, have been crucial in supporting the uh, rules-based order. Uh, the last uh, things that I, I'll mention before leaving, because there's, there's so much uh, to go on, uh, is uh, looking at different ways that the U.S.-Japan alliance will evolve uh, in perhaps non-traditional or cross-domain uh, ways. So we talked about technology, we talked about uh, a little bit about cyberspace, AI, uh, looking at new, um, uh, new domains which the alliance is, is, is moving forward in. Uh, so this is something that, um, uh, th that I think uh, hopefully will be a new direction uh, for the Alliance to go in. So I, I think I'll stop for now. That was uh, terrific. And I know we got the basis for a very good uh, workshop report. In the interest of time, what I would ask is uh, for panelists and uh, our APAR core group here, if uh, perhaps during the reception or at the dinner, if you have any thoughts that would inform their uh, workshop report, things that you might have missed uh, here, Please let uh, both of them know. But uh, thank you very much, and I know your hands are sore after this exhausting nine hours. So we're going to wrap up now. And first, uh, Ambassador say, and then I'll uh, say a few words after him. Well, thank you very much, uh, sitting long all the time. And uh, I want to thank uh, Rappo, too, uh, uh, did a great job. And thank you very much. Uh, and there are some of the things we, we didn't debate, but uh, that was also an uh, important part of uh, th thought for the future. And um, uh, every time uh, I come to uh, uh, this kind of uh, gathering, I won't always say to this, I mean, uh, say, talk about this uh, to American audience. In spite of all these uh, problems and divide and disputes and confrontations in the United States, I have a deep, deep love and trust to Americans and also American institution you built more than 200 years. And, and sometimes good there is goes up and down and so forth. We do have the same stuff. I mean, Japanese politics goes up and down. Some years, and uh, we are missing from radar. We were told that where is Japan gone? We are gone. But in spite of all that, we knew that uh, we haven't really changed the fundamentals there, our fundamental spirit. Uh, uh, as a Japanese nation I and mean, people, I mean, f basic things, you know. So I don't think that America is losing all these be uh, basic fundamentals. You are strong, and uh, what you were missing is your own confidence. So uh, it's great for you to be uh, looking into yourself and search yourself and what's bad about it, and uh, that's healthy. In some countries, you know, some people can't do it. People can't do criticize the government or whatever. So, I mean, they need to go to jail. I mean, so we don't see that in this stage. So you are basically healthy and strong. So for that, I wish you good luck. And thank you very much. So uh, just some uh, closing thoughts here. We're we're about to transition. So uh, to try to change the uh, mood here from the, uh, the very deep, heavy analytical uh, debates of the day. Uh, two observations that, uh, that I had. The first is that uh, Professor Tetsuo Katami had the expression of embracing the dragon. Uh, now, in the United States, we've had a very popular uh, cartoon series movie that uh, is called How to Train Your Dragon. So what I would recommend is that you consider for your expression, rather than embracing the dragon, how to tame your dragon might be an alternative for this. And the second is free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, that's the expression of the day. But when you use that acronym, free and open Indo-Pacific, sounds pretty good. But when you use the acronym, it's FOIP. And I think we're going to have to relook this right now, because I just don't find FOIP very inspiring. Um, <laughs> So a, uh, a f final word, a, a substantive word here is that 
uh, I truly did find this to be a very stimulating uh, day. And it's, we're talking about very important topics here. Uh, we had uh, just the best and the brightest from uh, Japan, the best and the brightest from the United States to uh, talk about this. Wonderful, we had some students in here in the community to uh, listen to these uh, debates. But when you think about uh, how we started off with David Kennedy talking about the Groshen moment and how it came together, I thought very, uh, in a very interesting way at the end with uh, Jim uh, Ferron with uh, Rio putting up that very interesting uh, two by two with uh, Steve Krasner commenting on it uh, and many here commenting on it. I thought that uh, was capturing exactly what the value of a gathering like this is where uh, whether or not we're at the Groshen moment, we do know there's been some very significant changes over the last several decades of the change of the distribution of power in the Indo-Pacific area and throughout the world. Uh, we are seeing a, a steady erosion of values and norms that we took for granted. I take Don Emerson's point about the uh, importance of agency. So uh, whether or not we're at the Groshen moment, so to speak, whether or not the San Francisco system is about to, uh, is about to collapse, uh, there are some very interesting things that are going on, and I think it's incumbent upon us to bring people like this together, where the people that are in policy, whether they're in Tokyo or whether they're in Washington or whether they're in Beijing, as they have the framework that they're dealing with, they're dealing with the problems of the week, the next week, uh, these kind of discussions where you're looking at big possible alternatives, I think it's extraordinarily uh, valuable. And I look forward to the uh, rapporteurs giving us the first draft of the report. With that, uh, you captured, uh, Ambassador, already this morning all of the thanks. But just to uh, reiterate, the staff on both sides uh, made this uh, happen. I'd like to especially thank all of the participants, but those participants that came from beyond St uh, Stanford uh, so not only from uh, Tokyo, but uh, Jim and uh, Tom, thank you for uh, making the uh, long trip here and adding so much value. And then a very special thanks to JIIA. Uh, their generosity uh, really led to this event here today. I've had a chance to uh, work with you before, Ambassador, and your combination with your organization of just your organizational skills, how good you uh, uh, make events, with the administration, logistics, but most important of all, the substance. The scholarship that you brought here today was just extraordinary. Now, if I could, then, that I would like to say a final word about the ambassador here. So we all talk about wearing different hats. And if you're in government, you know, the President of the United States, so he wears three hats. He's the chief executive, he's the commander in chief, he's the politician in chief. And today, the ambassador, uh, he was pretty extraordinary that he wore six hats today. If you could put those there. Oh. Okay, so hat number one, he was the symposium co-host. <laughs> hat number two, he gave the introductory remarks. Hat number three, the introduction guest speaker. At number four, he was the moderator. At number five, he was also a panelist. And hat number six, he gave the concluding remarks. Now, I don't have six hats for you, Ambassador. I've only got one hat, but I would like to uh, <laughs> give that to you. Uh, last but not least, so uh, we have a reception, as I said, open for everybody that's in this room, open to the public, and uh, that will be out in the foyer. At about 625, we're going to uh, start to make an announcement here that we uh, are transitioning to a dinner. The dinner is by invitation only. That's for the panelists and for the uh, special guests here at uh, Stanford. And so we'll make that transition. If you're going to the dinner, it's up on the third floor at the Oxenberg Room. Our staff here can help you with that uh, journey. If at 6.30 you're on top of the Hoover Tower, you are in the wrong place. Okay, thank you very much.
expanding and contracting my screen. I just as I started the remarks, the screen blew up to like 500%. Oh, yeah. I was like, ah, what's oh, yeah. to it? So I was slightly discombobulated oh, for a second. Yeah, 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 I've got to disable the, um, you know, because I haven't used it much, I've got to disable the, uh, the, the touch point for, uh, you know, for increasing the size. Oh, it's amazing how it came out. I was like, okay, I need to disable it. 